So what role does America play in Bible prophecy? Uh, How has this nation shaped our faith as Christians, Protestant and Catholic? Well, I believe that God really does have plans for this nation. I do. And I honestly believe that this nation is going to be a spiritual battleground in the very end times. Thank you. Now, uh, some of you were here last night. Some of you weren't. But today's sermon, really, honestly, it's a continuation of what we were talking about last night, how the great controversy has been playing out over the course of human history and how it's manifested. You'll remember from our last talk, the devil has been using all various different nations throughout history to misrepresent God in some way. And that Daniel, the prophet, he was given this really wild vision about how history was going to unfold. And it would be revealed to him through symbols, different animals representing different nations. And, you know, really, um, we, we could say that, you know, this was just God revealing the future to Daniel, just like historical details one after another. But I think it's much more than that. In part, it showed how Satan really has been tirelessly working to spread lies about God's character to the entire human family. You know, he used the nation of the Babylonians to suggest that God is barbaric, cruel, and interested in forcing people to worship him. The Medo-Persian Empire, they were used to misrepresent the Lord as an extremely strict God of pointless and arbitrary laws, which cannot be changed, even by God himself. Satan then used the Greeks to bring in philosophy, a philosophy which suggests that really the ultimate goal in life is just self-satisfaction and self-fulfillment, and that we ourselves can become like God through the power of logic and reason. As for the Roman Empire, they were used in an attempt to crush not only the mission and life of Christ, but also his followers. And they viciously persecuted the people of God, but they weren't successful. No. No, the gospel continued to go go out. And you know, Satan, it's very sad, he even used early Christianity, what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church, to introduce certain ideas about God which would cause people to fear and turn away from him. Ideas that would separate people from a genuine knowledge of the Father's love for them. All right, what about our country? What about America? Is it possible that this nation, which was founded on Christian principles, would one day be used by Satan to misrepresent the Lord? Well, to answer that question, I think it would be best if we look at what the Bible says about those nations which were involved in that final conflict, right before the return of Jesus. Let's go to Revelation 13. This is what John saw when he was writing down the Revelation. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on its horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I know not all of you were here last night, but basically this crazy-looking beast, it's this amalgamation, this twisted combination of all of the beasts from Daniel chapter 7, representing the nations of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And ultimately, it represents this combination of all the devil's different lies about God into one place. It was a collection of antichrist teachings which were eventually expressed in the official doctrines of the Catholic Church. However, it's really important to note who gave this beast its power, and that's the dragon. And who is that dragon? Well, Revelation 12 It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And really, that's that's his aim. That's his goal. You know, this isn't a conflict over power, as Kevin pointed out earlier. This is all about truth, 
What is the truth about God and God's character? Satan is the true enemy of God's people, not a particular church, not a particular government or people group. In fact, you know, the devil, he would love to see us fighting among ourselves over which church has the best doctrines, distracting us from the truth. But even so, you know, this description of this beast and its lies about God, it doesn't end here in this verse. We'll go forward to verse 5 of Revelation 13. It says, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And, you know, these great things and blasphemies, these lies about God, who God is, they were expressed through the historical teachings of the papacy. As I mentioned last night, you know, there are very many different types of Catholics today, very many different views in the church. But um, historically speaking, uh, they, they have taught some things that have pushed people away from God, and it became, very sadly, an entity which would maintain significant political power over various European nations for 42 months, uh, which, by the way, that's the same time period that we saw in Daniel, uh, that three and a half years. We can actually look at Daniel chapter 7. It says, He will speak against the supreme God, and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. You know, just 42 months, it's equal to three and a half years. It's the same time. Uh, it's talking about the same thing here. And last night, we talked about how Bible scholars have already figured out what these three and a half years represent. Uh, when they're calculated out according to the biblical lunar calendar, uh, back then, that's what they used, not the solar calendar of today. When you calculate it out, uh, you get 1,260 days. And the Bible teaches that each of these days represents a literal year. It says in Ezekiel, I have appointed thee each day for a year. And that's, that's how it works in Bible prophecy. And as we discussed last night, you know, the Bible is extremely accurate. Everything that God said about the future history. We know that yeah, the nation of the, the papal states, they gained prominence as a military and political entity in 538 AD, but they would lose that authority exactly 1,260 years later in 1798 when General Berthier, he led Pope Pius VI into captivity. And this power, which at one point tortured and executed millions of people who refused to submit to its authority, it's really undergone some dramatic changes since then, hasn't it? They're, they're not doing that anymore. In fact, it's really not quite what it used to be. It's no longer a tyrannical monarchy. And now we, we can very clearly say just by looking around, there are very many compassionate, humble, godly Catholics who demonstrate the character of God through their words, actions, and generosity. The devil has failed to use the Catholic Church to turn all of humanity against God. I mentioned last night that, you know, my aunt is a member of this church, and I believe that she and many others from the Roman Catholic Church will be with us in heaven one day. And that's because salvation isn't about what church you belong to, but whether or not you have a trusting friendship with the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so despite the devil's best efforts to use this church to turn people away from God, there are Christ-loving Catholics all around the world who refuse to believe that the Lord is cruel, punishing, and arbitrary. They won't take it. They don't believe it. And so now with another one of his plans failing to deceive the entire human race, Satan, in all of his frustration and anger, decided to see what he could do by working with another nation, an up-and-coming nation, a nation that would rise to prominence around this very same time, really just 20 years before 1798. It says in Revelation 13, 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Well, I could, you know, give you a bunch of like little clues about this nation and, and build up to like a really big conclusion at the end of the sermon uh, about what this beast represents. But I'd rather just save time and tell you, um, 
Yeah, really, through careful study, Bible scholars from various denominations have determined that this is a symbol for the United States of America. And you don't have to agree with me because that's not really the point of this sermon. I'm not up here to convince you about my views on prophecy. But even so, I do want to explain at least briefly why it is we see this beast as representing the United States. I don't want you to think that I'm just making this up to, um, for, uh, for the sake of a particular agenda. Uh, so let's look at this passage together. Um, we already know from the book of Daniel that a beast represents a kingdom or a nation, and that's from Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. We looked at that yesterday. But an important detail that I don't want you to miss is that this is described as another beast, meaning that it had to come into being after the first beast, after the formation of the papal states in the 6th century. And we know that America was established well after that, not until the late 18th century. Uh, This lamb-like beast is also described as gaining power and influence and rising after that 1,260-year period we just looked at from Revelation 13, verse 5. Um, As we said, that period ended in 1798, and history shows that America was rising to prominence during that time, just 22 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. You can go to the next slide. It's the same verse, but underlined a different part. Uh, You'll notice that another important detail about this beast is that it's described as coming up out of the earth. And you might remember from last night that the four beasts from the book of Daniel, well, I'll actually ask, where did they rise up from? Out of the earth or? Out of the water, out of the seas. That's right, they came out of the sea. Uh, We'll actually read that verse. It says, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So what does it mean when it says that these nations came up out of the earth or came up out of the sea? Well, we're told in Revelation 17, the waters which you saw are multitudes, peoples, nations, and tongues. So these beasts from the book of Daniel, the nations of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, they all rose up from the sea, a populated and developed area made up of numerous people, groups, and nations. And this is a very obvious description of the old world, Africa, Europe, Asia, the Middle East. But as we read before, the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13, it would rise up from out of the earth, the very opposite of the sea. This would be a, a sparsely populated area without the highly developed cities and empires of the old world. I think it's a very clear description of the new world, the Americas, where the United States of America would be born. Uh, Back in Revelation 13, 11, another detail is that this beast had two horns, like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. Well, when we're reading our Bibles and we see the word lamb, everyone, who do we think of when we think of lamb? Christ? Christ? Jesus. Absolutely. We think of Jesus. It says in John 1, 29, this is when... John the Baptist saw Jesus from afar and he points him out and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is Jesus. So this second beast of Revelation, it's interesting. It's described as lamb-like, meaning that it would in some way reflect the character of Christ. And really the only nation which could be, or which would be established on Christian principles on this side of the world in the late 1700s, was the United States. You'll you'll also notice that unlike the the first beast of Revelation, which had ten crowns and on all of those, um, right, it had ten horns and crowns on all of them, uh, this this lamb-like animal doesn't have any crowns on its head or on its horns. In other words, it would be a nation without a king. It wouldn't be a monarchy. It would be a nation that does not force religion upon its citizens. And I think this might explain why it has two horns, perhaps representing the ideals, the two ideals which made America so 
unique in the first place, and that's civil and religious liberty. Uh, We have a quote here. This is by Thomas Kidd. He writes for the Religious Freedom Institute. He says the phrase civil and religious liberty was a ubiquitous or a common phrase among Americans of the founding era. They did not sharply distinguish between the two for religious liberty required civil protections. And honestly, that's, that's what made the American experiment so outstanding and unique and different. Unlike all the empires that preceded it, America wasn't a monarchy, and there was no state-mandated religion which everyone was required to practice. And, you know, it's kind of funny because we just sort of take it for granted today that we can sort of do and say whatever we want, basically, Uh, you know, with minor limitations here and there. But, I mean, for the most part, we just have, like, absolute freedom in this country. You can believe anything. You can say almost anything. But back then, it was like, that was a genuinely novel idea. It was something very new. So when the Bible is describing a people coming to prominence in the late 18th century, being established in the new world upon Christian principles, At least for me, it's very difficult to imagine any other nation fitting that description besides the United States. And, you know, you can agree with me or disagree with me about whether or not this interpretation is correct or accurate. Uh, And if America is really the second beast of revelation. Uh, But honestly, one thing is for sure. The devil all throughout human history has been working very hard to introduce lies about the Lord's character through a succession of different worldly empires. Even the early church. And, um, you know, his plans, though, to deceive the nations and stop the gospel from spreading, they've failed time and time again, haven't they? All throughout history, the devil tries something and then always fails. God's people still believe in him. They still trust him. They want to believe that he's good. And so he began thinking of how he could work with the United States in yet another effort to blaspheme the name of our God and King. Revelation 13, 11. It's the last time we'll look at this verse. It said that this lamb-like beast would one day speak like a dragon. The Bible predicts that America, you know, this nation founded upon Christian Christ-like principles would one day speak like a dragon, eventually practicing the devil's ideologies and endorsing his lies about God's character. And in all honesty, it didn't really take too long for our country to get there. Uh, This is from the Declaration of Independence, which is really beautiful. Um, It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a very beautiful thought. Um, But not even a hundred years later, uh, J.N. Andrews, a, a Bible scholar and missionary, he would write this, the same government that utters this sentiment in the very face of this declaration, will hold in abject servitude over 3,200,000 of human beings, rob them of those rights with which they acknowledge that all men are endowed by their creator, and write out a base denial of all their fair professions in characters of blood. It says, in the institution of slavery is more especially manifested thus far the dragon spirit that dwells in the heart of this hypocritical nation. And those are are harsh words, strong words. Um, But I think entirely appropriate. And don't get me wrong, I love this country, and I love the freedoms that we have, and I love that we can gather together for worship. And um, I'm happy to be here. But even though this country was founded on Christian ideals, America has, just like every other nation, it has fallen short of living up to God's holy standards. I would say by the practice of slavery alone, the United States has already been speaking like a dragon for a long time. Uh, But, you know, there's more recent examples. I mean, this is just one. 
You might think of the way our country's military has utilized torture, sexual degradation, forced drugging, and even religious persecution at different detention centers, like Guantanamo Bay, for example. I don't know how well you can read this, but um, this is a really sad story. When the detainees of this detention camp began a series of organized hunger strikes, our government undertook a rebranding effort by simply referring to the strikes as long-term non-religious fasting, if you could believe it. And, I mean, that's uh, pretty awful, I think. And so far, we've talked about different things that the government has done. But the devil just, um, he hasn't only been working in the government. He's also brought lies about Jesus into the national consciousness through religious teachings that make our creator seem like an arbitrary monster. This is um, a painting of the idea of manifest destiny. And manifest destiny, which is this belief that the expansion of the United States throughout the Americas was a, a justifiable part of God's plan for our nation. This was an idea that was taught and supported by many Christian leaders. And unfortunately, it was, it was used in different ways by different people. But yeah, at different points in our history, it was used to defend our nation's actions and the near genocide of indigenous peoples on this continent, as well as our involvement in multiple wars. And Christian ministers were saying, well, you know, God has put us here for a reason. You know, we are here to, to go to war, and we're here to conquer and do this and that. I think it's very sad that God would ever be represented that way. Um, it ultimately taught that God practices favoritism. And that he doesn't really desire the salvation of all of his children, but just a select few. But that's just, what the, that's just the opposite of what the Bible says. It says in Romans chapter 2, God does not show favoritism. It doesn't get any more clear than that. Uh, it says in Matthew 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. God loves all of his children on this earth. No, he doesn't show favoritism. And sadly, you know, the teachings of eternal punishment in hell, the switch from Saturday Sabbath to Sunday, they were inherited by preachers in this nation from early church tradition. And though many of them had good intentions, and I, I really do believe that, they were ultimately teaching that God is a cruel punisher and that his laws were really nothing more than arbitrary, changeable rules. That's it. But again, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. It says in John chapter 3, For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. That's the heart of God. And Psalm 19, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There's nothing arbitrary about it. It's for our benefit. And so what I want to talk about next, um, it might be a little bit touchy for certain people, and not that, you know, I haven't been talking about controversial ideas already. Um, but I wanted to bring up the evangelical movement and particularly how it's been manifesting in our country, in America. Um, you know, while true evangelicalism teaches the truth about God's love and the message of the cross, that's true, you know, evangelicalism. Um, American evangelicalism has morphed into f something far less noble. And I I'm not going to name any names, but there are certain evangelical leaders who fully endorse using federal legislation to accomplish the will of God in our country. They believe that it's God's will to use the laws of the land to force people into behaving a certain way. And this, by the way, is speaking like a dragon. Uh, nations, they speak through their use of legislation and the enactment of laws. And various evangelical preachers and leaders are pushing for the government to pass rules and regulations that would enforce their concept of morality upon others. And this is a, a photo taken from a, a gay pride event. 
Um, I'll ask you, you know, does this photo make you uncomfortable? Does it upset you enough, though, to the point where you want to take away these people's freedoms and force them to act a different way? No. I hope not. Because that's the way the devil operates. He is one to take away freedom and to force. But sadly, there, there was a large number of leaders in the evangelical movement who would be happy to support laws that force people to behave in ways which they deem moral or appropriate. Yeah, they, they hope to combine church and state to enforce biblical morality through legislation. But that's not how God is. The Bible says that Jesus is the God of liberty. Consider what was written in Joshua, chapter 24. These are the words of Joshua, but I think God is speaking through him. But if it seems wrong in your opinion to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. God wants us to make a free will decision about what we do with our lives. He does not want to control our behaviors through rules and regulations. In fact, God so highly values our freedom that he was willing to even die for it. It says in Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. As he so highly values our freedom, God is not a God of control, but instead he is the God of freedom who desires people to choose righteousness because that's what they want. But what about salvation, the plan of salvation? How has Satan worked through American Protestantism to distort the truth about the gospel? And what have our ministers taught regarding the pathway to eternal life? Uh, we'll start with something historical. You know, this handsome fellow here, his name is Jonathan Edwards. He is an American revivalist preacher. Well, he was. And um, he was a theologian who played a, a critical role in the shaping of the first great awakening in America. He's a big figure. And he's probably best known for his sermon and you've probably heard of this, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Has anyone ever heard of that title before? Yeah? I remember learning that, um, yeah, when I went to a private Christian school, we had to read that sermon. That was something else. Well, it's a sermon which speaks, um, it very much speaks to the way most people viewed salvation in colonial America. And the basic premise is this, that Humanity has broken the laws of God, and because of this, God has become very angry with us. He hates it when we break his laws, and he desires to throw us into hell and torture us for all eternity because that's what we deserve. And um, I mean, does that sound like crazy to anybody else? Like it's, it's wild that you know, this, this was like a popular thing. But I'm not making this up. Uh, you can read all of Jonathan Edwards' sermons online, um, they're super harsh, and they make God look like a, like a temperamental um, bureaucrat executor. Um, now, in this view, you know, what can a sinner really do? Uh, there's not much. Uh, we've incurred the wrath of God, and now we need to find some way out of the situation. Also, uh, God doesn't kill us. So what's the solution? Well, we need to appease him. And we need to find a way to move his heart so that he might be willing to forgive us. We need to find a way to soothe his anger. And this is what they taught. So Jesus, who apparently loves us more than the Father for some reason, he decided to come down and give his life as an offering in our place. And because Jesus took the punishment that we deserved, the wrath of God could finally be appeased. After all, what God really wanted, according to them, was to punish somebody. That's all he wanted. Um, does anybody in this room like that description of God? No. I, I'm not surprised. But this is basically the, the foundation for how Americans would view the God of the Bible for years and years and years to come. But praise God that this is not what the Father is like. It says in Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious 
and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. It says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, while we were rebelling against him, Christ died for us. That's the God of the Bible. Uh, you know, when I read these verses, I, I don't even understand how they, they came to some of the conclusions that they did. But that's, that's how much Jesus loves us. And I praise the Lord because this whole idea that God is angry with his sin-enslaved children, it would eventually fall out of public favor. Although there are still people who see God in that light today, unfortunately. However, this view would only be replaced by something that's perhaps even more out of harmony with God's Bible truth. Uh, The devil would give America some new misrepresentation of God to work with in order to separate people from the love of Jesus. Um... I don't know how well that, oh yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but this, this is a book. It's something called The New City Catechism. And for those of you who don't know, a catechism is just, it's very simple. It's a list of doctrines in a question and answer format. And this particular catechism was edited by Colin Hansen. You probably don't know him. But it was put together with help from Pastor Timothy Keller, and that's a name you probably do know. And, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for Tim Keller. He has done amazing work in the fields of um, church planting and evangelism in urban environments, especially major cities. But I, I am very sad that he has endorsed and helped to put together this book because it's not just a book, it's a, it's a teaching tool, which is used to teach people different ideas about who God is. And um, it's being used in churches all around the world. And I'll tell you why it's upsetting for me, because the New City Catechism, basically it teaches a plan of salvation that's based entirely on legal principles. And what I mean by that is that in this legal model of salvation, We start out with the same problem. Humanity has broken the laws of God, but instead of God being angry, we are in trouble with God. We are in legal trouble with him. It's not that he's angry, but that he is legally bound to impose punishments on his rebellious children. Even if they're sorry, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if they repent. The law has been broken, and a punishment that is appropriate for lawbreakers must be carried out on someone. At least one person has to be punished for the sins of humanity. You know, saying sorry and trusting in the Lord, it isn't enough. And people who advocate for this model, and I understand why they do, they're saying that God's justice, which is an inseparable part of his character, is when the Lord enforces punishment upon sinners, since that is what's fair and right. And I, I would argue that probably in our minds, that kind of makes sense. You know, when there are people in the world who do really evil things, it feels good for us. We feel like justice has been served when something happens to them that's sort of equally appropriate for whatever evil thing they've done. But God is very different from us. And I, I think that's the main issue with this catechism and teaching. Um, God's justice is is much more merciful than ours. Well, yeah, God's justice is very different from human justice. Um, Well, this teaching, this model of legalism, it basically teaches that God, he actually loves us and he wants to forgive us, but he's actually stuck in a legal bind. You know, his hands are tied because we've broken the law and by nature he's a punisher, so he has to punish. Um... And how is the sinner saved in this model? It's a little bit better than the the punishment. Well, it's not that much better. Basically, the idea is this. Once again, Jesus is the answer, and that he was willing to give his life on the cross of Calvary in order to pay legal fees that, you know, we had accumulated as the human race. And because Jesus has paid these legal fees, 
God is now able to forgive us and bring us into heaven. Um, does that sound good either? Something about it's like a little bit off, right? Um, when you read it, you know, just out loud, I mean, it sounds very strange. There's nothing in this model about receiving a new heart. I think that's the major issue. There's no genuine need for actual transformation because it's all just about kind of account balance transfers. Um, and, you know, I will admit, the New City Catechism, it does talk about becoming more like God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I agree with that. But it simultaneously teaches that this is only possible because of the legal exchange which occurred on the cross. It has nothing to do with our trusting in God. Uh, And so I actually want to read um, a couple of questions and answers from this catechism just to give you an idea, uh, just so you see what I'm talking about. Uh, It asks for question number 18, will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? And the answer is no. No. Every sin is against the sovereignty, holiness, and goodness of God, and God is righteously angry with our sins and will punish them in his just judgment, both in this life and in the life to come. It's in this life too, so you, know, you better watch out. Um, they, you know, they add some additional commentary as well. This is actually by Charles Spurgeon. He wrote, God therefore not out of arbitrary choice, but from the very necessity of rightness, must punish us for having done wrong. Uh, What about question 19? It says, is there any way to escape punishment and be brought back into God's favor? And the answer is yes. To satisfy his justice, God reconciles us to himself and delivers us from sin and from the punishment for sin by a redeemer. And I I want you to think about this idea carefully. This is talking about satisfying God's justice. So let's read the commentary, and let's see what satisfies God. Uh, The commentary, this is by Mika Edmondson. He wrote, The catechism is careful to point out that the cause of God punishing Jesus in order to rescue us was grace apart from any other considerations. Uh, So in other words... By punishing Jesus, God was somehow satisfied. That's, that's what true justice is in this model. And question 28. What happens after death to those not united to Christ by faith? For those people who haven't become Christians, the answer is, at the day of judgment, they will receive the fearful but just sentence of condemnation pronounced against them. They will be cast out from the favorable presence of God into hell to be justly and grievously punished forever. It's, um, yeah, really sad to me. And, you know, this is being taught to Christians and their children. There, there's a children's version of this catechism. And uh, there's, like, little catchy songs so that they make sure to learn, you know, the different ideas, including this. Um, It's being taught to people all around the country, all around the world. This is a very popular teaching. They're being taught that God, by his very nature, is a punisher who must execute judgments upon his disobedient children. They're being taught that the Father is only able to redeem us because the punishment that he planned on giving you and giving me was transferred to Jesus. And that by punishing him, he's somehow satisfied and able to offer us forgiveness. And I I think it's really unfortunate, but in this model, Jesus' death on the cross is just an expression of God's punishment for sin. It's just a total legal penalty which needed to be carried out before he could save us from, you know, the supposed justice of tormenting confused and deceived souls in hellfire for the rest of eternity, which I don't see as justice at all. In this model, God is essentially saying this. This is like the the summary of all the thoughts here. You either learn to love and trust me, or I will personally throw you into hell and make you suffer forever. And I I don't buy it. I reject that. That's evil. That's, That's straight from the devil. Because that is not what the Bible says about our Heavenly Father. This is not what the Bible teaches about the problem of sin and the plan of salvation. 
let's go back to Genesis. We looked at this last week, or maybe two weeks ago. I don't remember. This month is a blur. God said to Adam in the garden, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. God was giving Adam a warning. God didn't say, Adam, if you eat from that tree, I'll kill you myself. No, he was giving Adam a clear warning about the consequences of sin. He wanted Adam to know the awful results of rebelling against God and putting himself out of harmony with the laws of love. It says in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. That word wages, you know, wages or paychecks, they are something that you earn. It's something that you have to earn yourself. Death is not a punishment which God is required to enforce upon his sin-sick children. No, it's, it is the natural result of rebelling against our Savior, the one who is willing to lay down his life for us. So the truth about salvation is this. It's true. You know, we all have indeed rebelled against God. We've all broken his laws. But this didn't cause him to become angry with us. Nor did it put us in legal trouble with him. Not at all. Sin has made us sick to the bone. Which is why it's compared all throughout the Bible to leprosy. Just a really awful disease. Sin is an illness. Or as Brother Peter Nance said last week to me, it's a virus. It's insidious. You know, it it infects you and it changes you. And we've inherited this sickness because humanity has accepted the devil's lies about God, causing our hearts to become twisted and deformed, causing us to fear him. So sin is not a legal problem. No, it is a heart problem. And that's exactly why David would write in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He understood, you know, this wasn't about, you know, some kind of arbitrary forgiveness or his record being cleansed. He needed to become a new person because he recognized that he was sick. So Jesus didn't die on the cross to pay a legal penalty. He wasn't punished by the Father in our place. No, Jesus died on the cross because it was the only way to create an antidote for sin. He died to reveal the truth about the Father, because that truth is the only thing that can free us from the slavery of sin. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 8, the truth will set you free. He didn't say, my legal substitution on the cross will save you. No, it's only the truth about God that can set us free. Jesus said, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And I truly believe knowing God is this. It's understanding that he truly is love. He is exactly as loving as he claims to be. He's as loving as he has demonstrated over thousands of years. God is Love. It's understanding that he has no desire to punish sinners, but rather to save as many of his sick and suffering children as is possible. God called out to his people in Ezekiel 33, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn away, that they turn from their sins and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? I mean, can't you just hear the sorrow in his voice, the love for his children? So the truth is that there's only one true solution for sin. And that solution's name is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's truly only by turning our eyes upon Jesus 
and fixing our attention on him that we can be set free from sin and all the false teachings which the devil has used to separate us from the Father's love. It's by continually focusing on Jesus, the one who gave his life for our freedom, that we can finally be healed and be given new hearts. He sacrificed everything for us, 100%. And he's calling us to rethink and reevaluate what we truly believe about him. His sacrifice, it revealed the lies which we need to recognize and separate ourselves from. And it's time for us as a people to reject all of the misrepresentations and all of the lies which the devil has presented. And instead, look to Jesus and see the truth about our Heavenly Father. Because he truly is the way, the truth, and the life. But he wants us to freely choose him. And he was willing to give up everything that you and I might have that freedom. Jesus, he used his infinite power to guarantee our liberty and free will, giving us the choice as to whether or not we would like to love and trust him. So this morning, if you want to embrace the true character of God into your heart, our loving father who loves us with a perfectly selfless love, and if you want to fix your eyes upon Jesus, that you might be transformed into his image, then I ask that you please stand. Stand with me this morning as we sing of our God and King, the God of love and the God of true liberty. <laughs>